Hi guys, welcome back to Finding Tesoros. First of all, I want to wish you a happy new year. May this 2022 be a great year for all of us. In today's video, we're visiting Eagle Mining in the town of Julian in California. I just got to Eagle Mining. I'm very excited to experience the gold mining tour. Last year, I went to a silver mine over in Calico Ghost Town, so I cannot wait to see this one. First, we need to pay, so let's see, $15 per adult, $8 per child, and $1 per child under 5. Not bad at all. Let's head to the gift shop where they had the register. The tour starts at that red mill that we see over there. That equipment has to be really old. Watch your step here. Like everywhere else. This is uh, this is a uh, stamp mill, as it says, it's a five five stamp mill. You see the stampers; uh, those are all weights up there that are that are lifted by cams. And every time one comes down, it's 1,250 pounds of force. So I mean, when this when this uh, thing is running, you know, the earth is shaking like this, and uh, it would it would process 10 tons of ore in 24 hours. So, uh, but keep in mind that they had to mine out another 10 tons of non-ore just to get that one ton of ore. It originally was run by a wood-fired steam engine, and uh, uh, got a water tank up on the hill that's fed by a well, and so that supplied the water for the steam engine. But these, uh, you can see down the base here, are these anvils, and uh, this is what's at the the base of the, the stampers. This is the stamper. And uh, it would grind the ore down to the equivalent of about talcum powder. It had to grind it really fine because um, most of the metal in the quartz ore is in really small particles. I mean, so small that uh, you couldn't even really pan them out. That's why they use mercury. They have the next three collection stages. They would add water to the crushed up ore they collected it at the base of the machine. That turned it into a really fluid mud or slurry. And then it ran over big copper plate here where the plywood is at and that was pooled with mercury uh, and the mercury would pull those really fine particles of metal off just like a magnet and then uh, the larger particles uh, that didn't get caught in the mercury came down to this second uh, collection station which was like a, a rug or uh, a mat that has a lot of grooves in it and the larger uh, gold particles would get captured in the grooves and then the slurry comes down this this um, section here into this box. There's a bunch of small holes drilled at the back. And uh, this is a shaker table. So I'll show you how that worked. So to run just like that, that would shake the, uh, the slurry out of the box. It would, it would run across the table and you can see how it's slanted this way and that way. So it's coming down over the table. As it gets down here where they're adding more water, to make it to wash off the lighter stuff off the top the heavier stuff remains in the grooves and the lighter stuff runs over here I did it as a kid you know i i'm uh, 73 this year so oh, so uh you look great. back when i was a teenager uh, even 12 years old i went into a, a storefront where a prospector was selling you know mining tools and, and even mercury and i bought some mercury at 12 years old <laughs> <laughs> so you grew up in julian no, no, I, I grew up in um, Stanton. Oh. Between Anaheim and Buena Park. Mm. Morning. Kind of periodically back it up. I'm going to show this gentleman how to pan and, uh, for gold, and we are going in the mine. I'll take everybody in. Okay, so, first thing you want to do is grab a pan full of sand. And then you want to slush it. This action settles the gold to the bottom. Uh, gold being 10 hey, times Jerry, heavier than the sand. You want to take this big thing? I'm ready. Because uh, he's, he's just panning, so he, everybody else is done. They can go in. Uh, guys, uh, we're going to go ahead and go into my for the group. Just get some okay, so warmer, and then you can pan let's see what you got here. Yep. Right down to the bottom there. Let's see. There it is. 
Yeah, you guys gone. We did. Now, I'll show you how to clean it up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it settled in one little tiny little spot right here in the bottom. Yeah, go ahead. Take your time. We're still right. And then I'm going to rinse all that sand. No gold in that sand. There's your gold right there. So, it doesn't take a long time to separate it out. Get that little speck down there. I'm going to settle it one more time. Cover that gold and a little bit of sand. Rinse that last little bit of sand off there. I kind of kind of sloshed it a little harder. Let's do it again. I'm going to rinse that sand. So the miners, the, the panners would uh, grab that with their eyedropper, put it in their little pouch called a poke, a little leather pouch, put it in there. The, the water would soak right through into the leather, but the sand and the gold would, would remain. They'd clean it up later. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. After the gold panning experience, we're gonna go actually inside the mine. So let's check it out. What they had to do was scour the mountain to, because uh, the veins are gonna stick out because they weather slower than the rest of the dirt around. And uh, they found that they were running parallel like this. So what they did was they cut this tunnel like as an exploratory tunnel, perpendicular to the way the veins were going. So when they would hit a vein, they would mine it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you mine out a vein, that's called a, um, a drift tunnel because it's drifting with the vein. Okay, so uh, you gotta watch your head. It's, it's low in here. Uh, and we're gonna be walking between two, two uh, uh, rails here. The first part of the tunnel was all hand chiseled. You can see some of the tools that they used to do that with. Uh, they were only making three or four feet a day of tunnel. You know, it's slow and hard work. And this is called the, uh, the Eagle Vein. You see the port? Oh, yeah. And uh, let's see. Uh, different places. You can, you can still kind of see gold here and there. That might be mica or fool's gold, but it kind of looks like gold. It is a gold mine after all. So you see this <laughs> big spot right in there? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's probably gold up in there. Uh, so this goes way, way back. This goes like 75 feet back, and it also goes this direction too. Yeah, there's a house. Got a dummy in there too. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, they had they had to pull out at least one ounce per ton of ore, uh, one ounce of gold per ton of ore, just to break even. And uh, uh, that that's because the wages back then were really low. Uh, you know, the average wage of a, even a shopkeeper was like fifty cents a day. Oh wow! Yeah, and so the average miner got about uh, three times that, about a dollar fifty. And the. Uh, the uh, Blask, the guy who was in charge of uh, setting the charges, he got 250 a day, the powder guy. And then the foremans, of course, I'm sure got paid a little more. And then, of course, the, the claim owners got the lion's share. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so we're going to go this way. It's called the Star Vein. And this vein actually ended up producing the majority of the gold between the two mines. We're, we're in the Eagle Mine. We're headed for the High Peak Mine, which they, the two mines eventually came together. You can see a trace of, of the vein that they were following here. See that? Yeah. Put a gourd, put a gourd in there. And uh, up you can see how they went up into the ceiling. Because they were following the main. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, the the uh, the mines actually pretty much shut down in 1934 with the Gold Act. And uh, by that time, according to the books, uh, they they had anywhere from uh, had mined anywhere from. 50 to uh, more than $150,000 worth of gold at $20 an ounce. Of course, at our modern prices, that'd be millions of dollars. I'm showing you this tool right here because I don't have an example of it. Uh, up above, we're gonna, this is level six. The mine has 11 levels. And uh, right behind me is a 425 foot deep mine shaft with five more levels of tunnel. And. Uh, these are pneumatic drills. Uh, that means they run off of air pressure. 
Uh, so eventually they were using those, and you can see that that would fit, fit into the drill motor. But before they had the, the motors, they were doing it all by hand. And so there are three guys on a, on a mining crew, and they had between three and four mining crews, and they would do 10 and 12 hour shifts at a time. So uh, one guy would handle the drill bit, and the other two would slam the end with uh, sledgehammers. And each time the uh, drill bit got struck, then the guy would afterwards would pull it out, turn it, and put it back in again, because uh, otherwise the drill bit would get stuck. And of course, if it got stuck, it was a big problem to get out. Okay, so I'm going to show you more of the, uh, more of that. There, it's, it's really interesting stuff. Let's see how the mineralization. So, okay, so I look off, off to the left here, and you can see how they went way up into the ceiling. And again, that you know that goes back quite a ways. Uh, and this was actually a vein that came and went down this direction. So they, they, they tunneled that. And here's our mine shaft. There's another example of a, of a basket. They lo raised and lowered the miners down one at a time from the basket. And of course, once they were mining below in a tunnel, then they would fill this up with, uh, with the the ore and the tailings and they'd haul it back up again. I'm going to show you how they did that because we have the we have the hoist machinery right here. Watch, watch your head, it's kind of low in here. What happened back there? So 425 feet down and uh, five more levels of the tunnel below. Uh, this is the uh, the hoist machine. Now, we're in the high peak mine. Instead of cutting an explorer, exploratory tunnel, they just follow this, this huge ore vein all the way from the edge of the mountain. Do you see it? Oh, yeah. And look down the back wall. So uh, it took them probably 25 years to get this far and to, to mine all that out. And then they decided, well, they want to go down, you know, because there's got to be more ore down there. So by that time, this, this uh, hoist machine was available. It is a, a gasoline engine, although it, um, it would run on almost any fuel. It's kind of like a, a diesel engine. Like a, you can actually run a Mercedes diesel engine on just cooking oil. Yeah. It'd be a little smoky, but you can run it. Yeah. And by the way, look at the, where the exhaust is at. And that's not much of a muffler either. So, uh, And you can see all the soot in here. I found so, ore on the floor. A 10 horsepower engine. And, and that, all of that 10 horsepower concentrated in one explosion, that's going to make a lot of noise. Yeah. It had to have been deafening in here. Yeah. And smoky, right? And smoky. Yeah, this, yeah. Was, not a, this was not a nice job. Yeah. And, uh, of course, they had to be able to com communicate with the miners down below. So they used the bell system. This is the bell. And so the, the, the line was available to the various uh, tunnels down below so that they could signal up. And California had a standardized bell code. Uh, for instance, seven bells, pause, and then another seven bells means that there's an accident or, or an emergency. And, uh, and then they would follow that with the unique uh, bell code of the tunnel that they were in to identify where they were at. Here's another one, three bells, two bells, one bell. Ready to blast, you know. Mine foreman kept a good stack of store of candles and later on the, uh, the fuel for the lamps. And uh, uh, so the, the foreman would then coordinate to the ore carts down, the, uh, down to out of the mine. Now the, the tunnels are, for the most part, are cut at a slight down, down angle toward the entrance of the mine so that the full mine courts would just roll by themselves almost out. And then... Uh, the miners could easily push the empty carts back up again. Mm -hmm. And unlike some mines, um, some of the mines used burrows and donkeys to, to move the carts, but they did it all manually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna show you what it's like in here by candlelight. Here we go. And, uh, so we still measure 
we still measure uh, light intensity by foot candles. And you can see, you know, you, you can pretty much see what you need to do just by one candle. Mm -hmm. And a foot candle is one square foot, one foot away from the average candle. What, how, how they figured an average candle, I'm not sure. Okay. So the, uh, the miners, in order to save the candles and their fuel for their lamps, a lot of times they would just walk down the, the dark tunnel with, um, between the tracks and put their hand up so they didn't bump their heads, go all the way to the end where they needed to start to work, and then they'd light their candles. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what that's like. So watch your head again. Well, it's like a bicycle pump. So they would stick this all the way into the hole, start pumping air into it, into the hole, and then pull it out slowly, and that would blow the debris out so that they could pack it. This is a tamping tool that has a nice deep groove in it, and that was so that they could uh, tamp it full of black powder or whatever other explosive they were using, and that left room for the fuse to be placed. And originally their fuses were these hollowed out reeds with black powder in them. And so a reed this long would burn for about five minutes. So they'd yell, uh, fire in the hole, and you know, they, the miners uh, the miners would scatter and go far enough where they were safe, except for the guy who set the charges, because he needed to monitor to make sure that all the charges went off like they were supposed to. So I'm gonna show you where he ran to, to do that. This goes, uh, if this were laid on its side, it would be wide enough to drive a large truck down for 50 feet. Wow. That's how much material they pull out. Uh, there isn't actually material above our heads right here. It's just boarded off to keep stuff on the side of the, uh, the mine from falling on your head. So they, they boarded it up like that. Okay, so here's where the guy, the powder guy jumped into, called the jump hole in the other tunnels. And uh, so this would kind of shield him from the blast and he could monitor uh, and make sure everything went off like it was supposed to. Now he would, he would jump here and wait for about half an hour after the charges went off be, uh, for, if for no other reason, just to avoid all the dust, yeah. <laughs> wait for the dust to settle. And then he'd go back and, and, uh, and uh, put new, fresh fuses, because those fuses, especially the ones they made, were really prone to what's called sputtering. They would go out for minutes at a time and then suddenly pick up. It's so windy and cold outside. Hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time on Finding Tesoros.